Do people have any questions so far? In the last homework was the, was the sort of looking at a variety of different deep learning networks. And I sort of finished my lectures on that. Um, but we can certainly go into practical details. Now I'm switching to applications. And I gave you a homework time before this on uh, trying to look for your own applications where AI is changing the world. Um, yeah, here's uh, Gregor. I actually have a question for the class. Um, Jeffrey is presenting um, different material that you can try out and you can experiment with. And as part of this, <clears throat> you may be able to um, uh, uh, to create actually your own tutorial that you may even want to share with other students in the class. So when you when you try these things out, you may take notes and they may expand upon the example that Jeffrey is giving, or you may have found a really cool tutorial online that gives you more insight to some stuff that you didn't know before. And uh, so this is essentially an open call to the class to um, to redistribute or to develop tutorials that you can share with other students. And if you're interested in this, um, I think there's enough uh, ability to share this material within even our cyber training that dash DSC side, and uh, people can add their own material there if they want. Well, I was going to say uh, maybe the next time work the students write it prepare a short presentation on what interests them for basically preparing for the final project. Also, an issue you, you, you posted on the, uh, the uh, Slack channel or a uh, website you liked. Uh, yes, I did. I basically was looking through the YouTube videos from uh, Deep AI. Um, yeah. By the way, one of my early talks has a whole list of citations, links for introductions to deep learning. I, although I'm not changing the lectures, I am changing those Google slides as I add more, you know, because medium.com sends me a giant list of things to review. So I add, I add one or two a, a day actually at the moment from that source. It is amazing how much material there is there. So, so one thing I am finding, it's not a question per se, but, um, and it's something I've been wondering about is uh, the area of domain knowledge, because it nearly seems like one needs to have kind of like some, a healthy level of particular domain knowledge. Definitely. Uh, to appropriately apply what we're learning. Well, yeah, there was a, a year or so ago, I tried to understand data science and what what skills were needed and how data uh, data engineering, data science, and software engineering differed. And um, there's a, some studies by Gartner who introduced the concept of a citizen data scientist, and that is a person trained in a domain who then takes their domain knowledge and combines it and then adds data science capabilities. And they seem to think that was a very large source of jobs and, and, and development. And they saw, and actually at that time, I, they gave examples of teams which you could put together. I think I even mentioned that in my, my introductory talk about uh, the nature of data science teams, which has a mixture of pure data scientists, <coughs> citizen data scientists, data engineers, um, software engineers, and unicorns who know everything. So I think data, uh, it is pretty difficult to make progress unless you have domain expertise, like um, if at the moment I'm studying earthquakes. Well, I'm doing that because I have a, a college for 20 years, who was one of the best people in the world on studying earthquakes. 
Um, and that allows me some insights into what's important and which features are um, uh, should be ignored. <laughs> He just told me last night that around 11 o'clock that a certain piece of data was uh, completely useless and he was only, because he told me he was looking at it and I said, that's exciting. It was um, stress and strain data on the, in Southern California. He said, no, the data's useless. I'm just doing it for political reasons. So I, I will not look at that data. All right, so um, any, any other questions? Uh, otherwise, I'll get started on the applications. Now, there are these posted videos on applications, and I'm going to just work through summarizing them. And I'm going to start with, I think, the richest set of applications, which is health and medicine. If you look at the number of different types of networks and the number of different types of applications, I think health and medicine dominates. Because e-commerce is just one or two, which is perhaps um, even has made more progress on things. The number of actual distinct AI applications is relatively small. All right, so let me share my screen. Okay, so this is um, a summary of the health and medicine um, uh, recorded video, but it is focusing on the particular applications, not so much on general issues. And uh, well, these were the videos we have. Um, well, although I don't have one on science research, even though that's what I probably know most about, but. Uh, We've gone through various science research applications, such as earthquakes, and and uh, in in while we while in our introduction. All right, so here is actually some sort of a summary of what uh, what all this what these um, following slides will say, which are the where progress is being made. Um, so. Uh, Probably the most dramatic progress involves images, and that's simply because image analysis is so advanced outside medicine. And it's actually pretty straightforward. So if you're looking at the pathology application of, uh, that uh, you can apply the almost identical image processing network to pathology as is used in, uh, in the standard uh, things like ResNet, which are used in standard applications commercially. Another large source of successes is voice. It's not voices um, or sound is, again, hugely advanced commercially. And so you can just directly take those tools. The applications are not quite as exciting as images because they're the most obvious application, which is probably important, but not so exciting is uh, stopping the doctor having to write things down by recording them, automatically recording them, recording and uh, converting to text their voice, which is now pretty successful. Um, now, actually, the voice methods are all sequence to sequence methods, which are related to time series methods. And uh, there is a large amount of success in what is called, in, at least in these notes, the Internet of Medical Things or the Medical Internet of Things, namely the correction of small devices that are spread over the Internet, such as um, your smart watches and your health, health monitors and things like that. And uh, that, that pervades not only general people, but also it's the basis of a growing uh, success of telemedicine. Um, there are some, this is more specialized, but um, infant text processing is very successful again in outside medicine. Uh, I mean, it's what creates uh, the, 
analysis that drives the uh, the analysis of web pages and identification of things from recommender engines or something. And there are some applications of that technology which are directly related to um, to medicine. There's also some pretty important uh, applications which are fully connected networks, where this is again an example which is outside medicine, but is applied to medicine, namely it's for just taking lots of data and you just feed that data into a fully connected network and train that network to map that data into a result, such as um, you're healthy or you're not healthy or there's a problem or something. Um, and there actually, there's actually the digitization of health and medicine is also creating huge impact. That's what I mean by general IT, not especially AI. And as I said right at the beginning, I think health and medicine has the largest number and the most diverse number of applications because it actually has important applications over all these areas. Whereas if you say went to self-driving cars or transportation, you would find that um, imaging was probably the dominant uh, neural net network you're using. Well. All right, so let's now go on to the set of image applications. And I, these slides are taken with usually no change from the network. So here I just grayed out the things with, on this particular side, which were not um, imaging. And we'll actually go into more details of the um, of this Geisinger application, which is just uh, an image-based analysis to diagnose internal bleeding in the head. And um, it, it's just automatically highlights serious cases for immediate attention. And here's an assertion which I found online, which is that medical imaging is the one that will have the most impact in the near term. And that's essentially an X-ray scan, CT scans, and it will hopefully lead to improved diagnostic uh, capability and accuracy. And it will do it not only do it more broadly, but it will do it much faster. Because if you once you can do it, you can make it run almost as fast as you like by just buying a bigger computer. Um, so here are some um, examples of where imaging is important. So we have radiology, that's a one I've already referred to. Also eye studies are um, making important progress. I think, I think my uh, eye doctor uses uh, some, some image-based uh, analysis to speed up our, um, our sessions. And um, there's some specialized applications. One of the faculty here, James Glazier, is looking at a special disease using, uh, uh, using convolutional neural nets. And um, in fact, it was this one, it's diabetic retinopathy. I'm not very good at some of these, uh, some of these words here. Um, and here was an example about screening eyes for blindness uh, signals. And here is some survey about um, which IT areas will have um, the most impact. And here is AI for imaging or diagnostics, which is pretty highly rated. Uh, 52%. And AI for precision medicine is, we'll come back to that at the end, which I probably won't reach today, but uh, we, the end of these slides. Because in, the fact that you can do things so much faster means that you can, can produce medical plans which are customized for individuals. Um, and I, I say, although, it's, although genomics is obviously very important, it's actually interesting that uh, genomics was one of the earliest success stories in bioinformatics. So there's a lot of important machine learning in genomics, but there's not quite so much deep learning. 
Whereas deep learning has overtaken all other technologies in most fields, I don't think that's true in genomics. And I'm not certain whether that's, I mean, quite why that is. All right, here's just, so we're just running through examples here. So here's one where um, I actually listened to a talk on this by the uh, lead of the Facebook group working on this. This was Facebook in uh, uh, their AI group, uh, FAIR, Facebook AI Research Group, and New York University. And <clears throat> they just uh, reduced the image size and cleaned up the image using AI and uh, they managed to reduce the data size by a factor of four. So, and uh, the, the, so this was not trying to improve the diagnosis, but just to make the whole system run better because um, you save space. And of course, compression, which is what, the, what, what this means by reduction, is pretty important in many areas. Compression is how they, how you can actually store all the amazing amount of data on disk these days. And so opt optimizing compression algorithms is a very active research area. In the fields I work on, analysis of scientific data, which is those data sizes are very big. Compression is a big, an important um, research topic. Well, we already mentioned Geisinger's system for, um, uh, by look by analyzing CT scans, and um, the claim is that it increases decreases the time by a factor of twenty five, and um, they say give some example of a lady whose uh, symptoms were not identified as head bleeding, but uh, the AI algorithm uh, flagged it as uh, being due to that. And um, I don't think this picture here is terribly exciting. What it points out is that the things move through this imaging system. And what the imaging system does, it doesn't make a decision. It just moves, it sets the priority of images. So uh, as always, the radiology uh, radiologist um, looks at the images, but it, this allows the radiologist to get to the most sensitive images quicker. Of course, that's likely as likely as not to be replaced by automatic. Some of these will be done automatically um, or with very minimal radiologist involved, radiologist involvement, because obviously, well, you can see that's happening. That's the difference between driver assisted AI cars and self driving cars. Both of those exist, both are perfectly viable models, and you. Um, and why they're closely related, it depends how much you trust the AI. Um, so here is again this statement that oncology uh, uh, cancer that study is, is, is likely to be most impacted by AI, um, AI, well, precision medicine, namely targeting particular individuals. And um, there are some uh, alarming numbers here about the a number of errors in cancer diagnosis that um, cancer was due, was involved in what is a 38% of high severity errors and um, half of those high severity errors relied, resulting in death and the uh, insurance cost was nearly a billion dollars. And um, it is projected this type of this is, there's an increasing need to address this issue. And um, it appears people are more willing to let you test them genetically. And um, that should help to um, improve these accuracies. So again, though again, I point out that the integration of genetics with other forms of, um, of um, health applications, I think is still quite primitive. Uh, I, I dropped a slide in this deck, which explains why people thought that the fact that you could now do full, full person um, genome and that genomic analysis for a thousand dollars would really revolutionize um, 
healthcare, but it is not true. It has not revolutionized healthcare. It's useful, but unfortunately, the genetic tagging is not precise enough to, uh, to really make a huge impact. So you need to combine it with other, other signatures. So here is an example of um, uh, a um, press release from Microsoft about um, how they were working in India, which doesn't address cervical cancer as well as other places. And um, it is, uh, kills quite a few people. And uh, Microsoft has basically uh, produ produ produced the AI, which allows you to automate the identification of this cancer. And uh, here is a, a subtle sad chart showing how it's in North America, it's been addressed. Uh, whereas in India, which must be over here, it has not been addressed. And here we have a number, by we had a factor of 25 for guys, you know, this one is a hundred. So it's a similar type of factor. And um, presumably by saving people time, it actually saves a lot of money. Probably you're gonna actually screen more people this way, so that could increase some costs. But the, but presumably the high, the accuracy of the initial machine evaluation can probably uh, get mean that the, the radiologist only has to look at the very critical uh, critical pictures. Well, here's a slightly, slightly more fun um, use of uh, image image based AI. This is for um, for robots, which are using robotics is critically dependent on imaging to so the robot can uh, move around properly. And uh, here is a here is a press release about um, a, a robot drawing blood um, for the first time. And um, it, it was able to find the vein and draw the blood successfully. And um, I think its compromise success rate is competitive with that of human beings. Here we are, there's 4 billion costs just on mistakes and screw ups in the, uh, in the uh, drawing blood uh, procedures. Well, here is a company called viz.ai. Um, and um, it is using image processing to look for um, strokes ahead of time. And um, you can see here, it has the CT scanner, the AI detection, and then it goes not to the stroke specialist uh, after they've highlighted the uh, um, the data that looks as though it uh, indicates a risk. And as I said, so this has obviously made quite a lot of progress, this use of images. I sort of, I remember even four years ago when we were making the first house in the engineering department, I felt certain we should try to house somebody working in pathology with image processing, because it seemed to me clear that was a hugely likely area. Well, I was right, we couldn't actually f persuade anybody to come, uh, but I was right. But now it's almost so um, de facto that I'm not certain it's a, such a key hub because the whole field of pathology has switched to using deep learning. I had a, I have a very energetic friend in the University, St. University Medical Hospital and he has, he has switched his entire research effort from old fashioned um, image processing to um, to deep learning. Well, here we can look at CT scans to plot COVID-19. And um, that's uh, another always similar application of image processing to identify uh, COVID damage. And they're all sort of the same application. You start with some device that produces an image 
and then you pass that image through convolutional networks and 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 classify that image in certain various ways. Um, and of course, you have to train train the data, but you actually you typically use so-called transfer learning. You take the data trained on ImageNet. You sorry, you take the network trained on ImageNet, and then you add extra training for the particular medical problem at hand. All right, so that was a set of uh, image processor image applications, which um, notice most of them are about in the last three years. So they're not as though they're old, but uh, they seem a little old because the methodology is so well established. Well, the methodology is maybe seven years old, but uh, the medical application, I think, is rather straightforward. Not trivial at all, because you have to understand how to do the retraining. We were discussing being expert. Here, you really need the radiologists and the stroke specialists to tell you which images are important. So it's actually pretty hard work to do unless you either are a domain expert or have a domain expert on your team. All right, so here is uh, from May of a year ago, um, a, a, a list of areas in the Internet of Medical Things. So we haven't done the Internet of Things in this class, but we typically do it in other classes. Internet of Things is, of course, the collection of um, devices, which are small devices. And the most dramatic example of an Internet of Thing is the uh, smartphone. That is probably the still the largest source of Internet of Things data. And then there are things like this Fitbit, which are the health monitoring devices. But everything, there's lots of remote devices for telemedicine. Um, and uh, there are many, many remote devices you can buy, um, you, you can buy or, or use to study EKGs and things, everything on there. You can do everything, lots of things remotely. And uh, so, so like stethoscopes. So here we have telemedicine, um, preventive care, so that that just says the connected devices are basically monitoring the person continuously. So the person is no longer monitored once every few months for well, years when they go to see the doctor, they're monitored every, every second. And um, here we have a smart diaper looking for diabetes and things. So um, there's obviously, that's a pretty interesting area that you will just carry these devices with you forever. And hopefully any, any problems can be diagnosed quickly. Um, and here we have um, this, this sad, this, we will have another slide or two about burnt out doctors who are tired of filling in insurance forms and making notes. And um, <clears throat> this tracking, which is all automated, uh, um, presumably takes a lot of work away from the, um, from the doctor who can also use um, voice recognizing uh, medical, uh, medical devices to I say things like take their automatic notes and things like that. And here is a wearable, a medical, an internet, a medical thing to identify opioid um, uh, effects. And um, this is not an, I have colleagues who work in this area. I haven't studied this much myself. And again, if there were if the people taking opioids are willing to wear these devices, then obviously that could provide, be very important. Because here you can see there's a remote device looking at breathing patterns to see if their um, breathing is impacted. This is, is typically done on a bad opioid event. Um, well, Fitbit frustrates me. I have been worn their health devices for some years now. And um, the trouble is that they have the data, so they know all this information about me, but they, 
Uh, unlike, say, uh, 23andMe, which keeps telling me how much my genome is related to other people's genome, Fitbit never tells me how my Fitbit data relates to their averages and their norms. And um, in the past, at least, it was hard to get hold of Fitbit data, but at least um, Scripps, which is a very distinguished medical institution in San Diego, um, got Fitbit to give them 200,000 uh, users in five states. And um, I'm not certain this is such an exciting application. Here you note uh, connect, uh, trends in sleep patterns and heart rates, and you would correlate that with the onset of a flu epidemic. And uh, over here we had a now reasonably old estimate of the wearables per year. It's probably actually given the pandemic, I've got more than this now. Um, and it says 25% will be using wearables by 2022. <clears throat> it's actually interesting. People keep trying to estimate the number of, you know, the, the size of the Internet of Things. And there was a famous, in, in a minor subfield of the world, a famous uh, estimate by Cisco of 50, 50 billion devices by essentially now, which was clearly a gross over overestimate. Um, and still, I think smartphones are the majority of um, a sizable fraction of the number of wearables. I think the number of wearables is 10 to 20 billion. Not wearable, Internet of Things is 10 to 20 billion. Because a smartphone is not a wearable, I don't think. And though it's clear how if you put it in a pocket, it acts like a wearable. Um, well, here's a little discussion of um, how these new each device, whether it's from Fitbit or Apple, adds more and more sensors. And um, I gather when this was in August 2020, Fitbit had a new smartwatch, and it had um, monitored electrodermal activity, which is electrical changes uh, in your skin, and uh, that is meant to tell you whether you're stressed or not and uh, tell you to take a deep breath and go into yoga and things if, if necessary. And um, there is a little discussion here about a company, New Tigers, which is trying to uh, market various uh, devices that could go on smartwatches. To, to look, he's trying to, we're, we're trying to diagnose diabetes, depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. Um, and he, there's some negative comments about the quality of Fitbit sensors. Of course, Fitbit has to sell the watch to a real person. And so there are sort of probably two worlds. There is the world of really high quality sensors and the world of consumer sensors. I think only the consumer sensors are strongly developed. I don't think it's that easy to get high quality sensors and have them integrated into a useful environment. Um, but this is again an example. This is obviously there's a huge amount of AI can go into analyzing all this data, looking for patterns, identifying anomalies and things like that, all of which are natural deep learning applications. And then um, Apple's uh, new watch, and I'm um, not quite certain the date of this, this I left out the date. Um, it must have been last year sometime. And um, they were discussing uh, blood oxygen saturation monitoring and um, other such capabilities. And um, it's actually quite surprising to me how people have let uh, the other manufacturers let Apple dominate the smartwatch industry to such a large an extent. And um, so, right here, some other examples is. Um, 
There's this wristband called Halo from Amazon, which is monitoring health. And um, that's with a company called Sana. And um, it's, it monitors um, standard things um, which are relevant for these, how well you sleep and how, how what your heart rate is doing and things like that. And here we have um, smart cam cameras to produce 3D models of a user. That's sort of an interesting application. Um, here we have um, other examples. I mentioned the smart diaper from Smarty and the diabetes management application from um, this D D Dario Health. I say it is pretty interesting how many companies are in these AI and health and medicine area. There's huge amounts of money being put into this area because obviously venture capital understands there will be some, the people who win in this area will win big because there's a lot, everybody worries about health. So potentially if you have a winning application, you can sell it to everybody. Here is the digital stethoscope and again, it has an interface. In general, you would expect um, there to be, an in well, in fact, you always see that today. I mean, I have two medical, two health, two things that produce data about me. One is Fitbit and one is Withings. Um, and um, they each have their own interface, which is maybe not as pretty as this one here about the from Eco. But uh, they all tell me, but the trouble is they're not related and not correlated. So I see eventually, hopefully people will be able to, and I think people at Google is looking, is trying to do this in their Google health system, trying to integrate the results of multiple, um, multiple internet of medical thing devices. And so you get a complete picture of what's going on. At this stage here where everything is starting, and um, it is not, it is clearly very diverse. I mean, very incoherent and there is no um, uh, uniform approach. Uh, well, here's a, so this, you, I'm not certain whether this is imaging or, or internet or medical things. So here was an example of the beginning of the COVID pandemic, March of 2020. And uh, this uh, hospital here was using a video robot uh, to basically, this is a, really a telemedicine example, to monitor people in a COVID pop-up tent. And uh, the people inside the emergency room were able to identify the patients that needed uh, urgent help. And so this idea of video robots is pr pretty promising. And because um, you can, uh, well, I say, you can actually improve the safety of the healthcare workers and also reduce their um, reduce their workload because that video robot can essentially take a lot of medical data through with these remote devices, and uh, as well as keeping just having a nice automatic distance social distancing by keeping the having the robot interact with the with the patient not the not the medical profession professional here is an example i have a picture of it here of uh, spot dr spot and um it's um, boston dynamics is a well-known ro robot company and um, it is again an example of a slightly more sophisticated uh, medical analysis, a remote medical analysis system, and um, it has the same. It has the same application, and it is built in to do these different things. You can do remotely skin temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood oxygen. These were ones already mentioned actually for smartwatches. Um, this at this time here, which was uh, August 2020, was still in a prototype phase. And um, so that's that with the people 
properly masked up. Uh, well, the US uh, military, or actually any military, is a pretty important uh, um, customer for medical medicine. They're, everybody wants to keep their war fighters uh, fit. And uh, so they, um, they are often pioneers. There's a lot of money spent by DOD on medicine. And um, here we're looking at uh, COVID-19, but uh, the use of wearables by DOD must be pretty, pretty high. And also DOD can probably order its uh, war fighters to, um, to, to wear the wearables because uh, they have complete command. Um, so this is rapid analysis of threat exposure. Those how the remote device identifies uh, medical threats and sends it back to the medical command post. So this moves on to the sort of, remember when I gave an example of um, the areas of application of um, of internet and medical things, telemedicine, I mentioned. Um, I don't know whether Gregor remembers, but I spent a lot of time on telemedicine. And when I was at Syracuse University, we developed a marvelous application. I still have my photos of myself of, uh, showing it to Hillary Clinton, who at the time was uh, greatly involved in, uh, in health, health issues. This was in 1994, and um, we had a really good system, which is used very, very old computers, but it was doing the types of things that you do today. And um, it was, and it was a total failure because at the time the technology was not ready for deployment or maybe the medical profession was not ready to be deployed on. And um, there are several companies growing up in this area, which um, enable two-way interactions between, uh, well, there, there's obviously two types of things. You actually have the medical session between your doctor and yourself, and you have the continuous monitoring of the wearables. And that's either going to be continuous or there's going to be uh, inst installations where you go and the, and this uh, spot robot takes all your medical data and sends it back automatically to the to the provider who may not look at it immediately. So there are various variants of telemedicine. Yeah, I have a funny story about this. Yes. So, although I placed Hillary Clinton's chair, uh, we for, foreign students were not allowed to be in the building. The Secret Service. Uh, gently asked us to leave. So we oh, really? I never knew that. We couldn't uh, participate in this activity. So we were all hanging outside. Oh, I never knew that. And I was, uh, I, she, I don't think she came just to see me. I mean, she had a set of people she was seeing, but she, suddenly she spent some time with our group. Um, Gregor was my student in Syracuse. That's why he would know that. Um, but I basically, this was actually done with a fellow called Dave Warner, who was a very, uh, very, very, very pioneering person in these areas. And I, the application that they did do was to prisons. They did do telemedicine prisons in those days, but not, not general telemedicine. And um, here is some sort of surveys from, which, uh, from Business Insider, which, um, basically um, says that uh, telehealth is going to have an increasing effect and um, just and for especially suitable for routine care where nuts which are very time consuming but doesn't need special special uh, uh, capabilities. And of course, it can be used for screening. We ought to be able to do screening much better than we do today. There was a nice, there's a, an organization called Doximity, which has a pretty nice uh, state of telemedicine report. 
and um, it said in 2020, uh, all uh, 20% of all medical uh, interactions will be by telehealth, and that's 29 billion value. And uh, he expects more and more, to, and that this particular report expects that to increase. And so it will come up to 106 billion. That's a pretty big increase by 23. Um, and the COVID has been, uh, of course, an important push for, for telemedicine because uh, according to this, before the pandemic, only 14% uh, had done telemedicine at least once. But now and after COVID, it was a much larger number. And um, it's sort of interesting, those with chronic illness, 53% of them felt it was the same or better. Um, and in general, it appears that telemedicine is um, uh, viewed as a success. This particular report has a breakdown of this analysis by types of doc types of care, which you could find interesting. It's a good report. I will. I mean, I, I have the the. I always post the Google slides, so you'll be able to directly get these links from those slides. Um, well, implied in all of this is mobile health, namely, which is only a little different from wearables and things, namely it's the actual system that takes the remote data and delivers it to some central cloud resource. Um, and again, they, this, this uh, suggests that this is gonna need, um, go, go, in, go in importance and um, it mentions the obvious people, Apple smartwatch, Fitbit health devices, uh, Google has a venture called Verily, which is, works in this field. And of course, Fitbit is now owned by Google, so, um, or Alphabet, I should like to say. And um, we already saw the Series 6, where that was when I said I didn't have a date. The date should have been September 2020. And um, I think this is pretty exciting, actually. I think many people, like suddenly I, would prefer to um, be able to monitor myself on an ongoing basis. I don't have to wear it, namely I have a, well, what do I have? I have a, I have a blood pressure device uh, and things like that. So we have different devices. I have an EKG device. And um, so those are transportables, not wearables, namely you can, you can put them on when you want. So in front of your computer screen, you'll have a little box beside you with all the different uh, medical devices you need to look at. Maybe that's, that's something like that was bound to happen. Um, well, this is as I can see is effectively implied by telemedicine, remote patient monitoring and um, we already pointed out the Fitbits and good example of this. And that being the other, well, GE, which is a well-known medical device company, as well as making uh, engines, jet engines and refrigerators, it also makes medical devices. It's already a member, a participant in this. In fact, GE was the company that pushed the concept of the industrial internet of things, which is the variant of the medical internet of things or the internet of medical things where the, the, the um, remote devices are sitting on things like refrigerators, air conditioners, and other, other remote devices made by people like G, GE, which monitor the efficiency and working condition of these devices. And here, of course, what we sort of see in this, we saw this with the, um, opioid uh, um, system where um, this is where this is these are devices that basically call alerts if the health of the patient is uh, uh, it seems to be under threat and of course the AI is needed because you need to make a decision whether the person really whether you really should alert you do not, you have, it's a 
gathering data is not useful. What's there? And the only, data is only useful if it produces conclusions. So you have to have this data monitored continuously for to flag anomalies, which then would dispatch somebody to, to, to care for the person whose uh, first device uh, was signaled. Because uh, there's no way people are just gonna look at it randomly. So you, there has to be um, the, the anomaly detection, which is a particular example of or some sort of taking the data, integrating with everybody else's data, looking for outliers or looking for inliers and telling the patient, wow, well, your, your blood pressure is now totally okay. Don't worry about it. It looks okay. People often fluctuate the amount you see and things like that. Um, All right, this is a shorter section, uh, which is the, so that was, so far we've done AI based on images, AI based on medical internet of things. Here we do AI based on voice. And here we have, well, this is slightly flaky voice, namely it's ultrasound, which is sort of a, a di diagnostic uh, acoustic signal and um, this is for um, using ultrasound to get cardiac uh, alerts. And um, this, is, this is actually, um, this is actually to help people perform these tests to show that the tests are properly done. Here's a totally different use of voice. And these is cuddly teddy bears or cuddly robots, which um, ch cheer up people in hospital. Uh, I still remember when I went to the consumer electronics uh, show in Las Vegas a few years ago, there were a huge, every, every uh, faculty member at CMU seemed to have started a company uh, to make cuddly teddy bears, which uh, had AI built into them to be able to respond uh, meaningfully to your comments. And um, actually I've already, I shouldn't move, I shouldn't. Um, my my uh, daughter who's 15, she uses Siri and Google Assistant continuously. She asks them, well, how do I, how do I cook this meat? Oh, how do I do this integral? Sort of interesting. That maybe the generation she represents is going to rely much more on AI based um, voice recognition systems. And uh, I, I never use such systems. So, but maybe I don't cook meat properly and I don't, um, I can do integrals, but uh, probably as well as Google. But uh, I don't think I can cook, meat, cook meals as well as Google. So, anyway, I'm just pointing out that this is, I think, this area is quite, it's not as, it's not as um, whiz bang as say, uh, identify self-driving cars, because it's um, slightly softer area where you're just trying to, I, where you have to do some rather precise voice recognition to see what the person said. And then you have to do, use probably some sort of a deep learning, fully connected network to take that question and map it into an answer. Um, and we've already discussed the, um, the stressed out doctor problem and that these, these robots can essentially follow doctors around and help them by just producing the administrative paperwork or digital work automatically. As it says, scribing the text the notations, keeping track of records and making certain that the orders are sent to the right places. Well, there's this burnout problem, which is that uh, um, there is meant to be some pretty large fraction of a doctor's time. Doesn't seem to say quite what here. He is actually spent um, on boring chores, which they'd rather not do and that is annoying them or burning them out or whatever you want to say. And um, 
All right. So, well, obviously, treating COVID patients, you have had a lot of stress, but more generally, the 40% number of being um, before the pandemic was uh, a reasonably high number. So if we can remove the routine work from physicians, that's obviously a good idea. And there's voice recognition and simple AI to be able to uh, transcribe the voice and keep track of the uh, consequent records, automatically sending the information out to the uh, uh, to the pharmacy and things like that is um, pretty important. And there are multiple people working in this uh, field. Um, so here we have um, an example of, uh, this is called healthcare administration, this burnout issue for obvious reasons. And um, I, I wouldn't, I think all of this AI is going to be deep learning effectively. And you can see they have here physician di dictation, real time transcription, transcription, taking care of the routine tasks and the pre visit and post visit services, and documenting electronic health records and automating tasks. So these are all natural administrative functions, which probably can be done actually better by a digital assistance because they are not, they don't really require decisions. They just require remember keeping a, a track of what's going on. And um, all right, so that's a pretty, pretty large field of, of important, if not uh, glamorous AI. So here is one, here's one startup, notable. Um, as far as, I mean, you know, there are many startups in this field, which you, most of which we haven't heard of. Uh, this one is running on an Apple Watch and um, but essentially interact, takes care of interacting the voice with the electronic health record system. And um, According to this uh, article here, the physicians save two hours a day just by using this system. So that's a pretty big number, two hours a day. Um, Suki is uh, meant to be a leader in this field. It's sort of interesting that, um, right, that how you can actually benefit from customization because the I'm sure Suki is not the leader in the voice recognition field. Google and uh, Facebook are the, and Microsoft are the leaders um, because they have the most resources and, and um, uh, must be number one in those areas. But anyway, so I, I don't quite know how Suki, what, how, I mean, usually these um, networks like BERT and things are, um, are, are, are open sourced and are made available. So anyway, so obviously Suki uh, business model is to take a state of the LARP NLP system and um, customize it for health, health or hospital use. So it's um, cut down according to this, the note taking by factor of four. And um, this AI learns and so it gets better every time. And um, we get the 76% improvement. Well, here we have this sad number that uh, the amount of administration is of every time spent T, two thirds of T are administrative. And as I said, this Suki uses, runs on a Google Cloud, but does not use Google Assistant. Here's a more frivolous example, which I uh, took out of, um, out of um, Amazon, uh, which was, um, you can look it up or will be guide. It is a Alexa powered automatic toothbrush which is presumably built in all sorts of clever things to um, um, make certain it produces the right rotation speed and the proper angles and things like that. 
and um, I say it actually can interact with Alexa, presumably not just for a medical task or toothbrushing tasks, but also to play the right music and things like that. Um, and also, of course, then uh, this means that um, Amazon can sell a, uh, a new smart speaker for you to put in each of your bathrooms. So it's an example of um, the broad based adoption of uh, voice based interaction systems in, in the sort of daily life of people. Again, I don't have, a, I have a rotating oral B toothbrush, but not an intelligent one. Probably I should get an intelligent one. Um, now everybody, at least I've found chatbots have actually become pretty popular and actually the, these miserable telephone systems you sometimes get tra trapped on are actually getting better. Although I must admit, I prefer the chatbots you interact with from web pages. And they're less stressful than interacting over the phone. Anyway, the claim is that, um, says here only 3% of the companies have no plans to invest in chatbots. So chatbots are just effectively doing the same idea that they're providing an assistant to um, to save the time of the uh, of the consultant or the expediter who actually answers your call. I never, I, every time I call up, I'm always trying to find a way of ignoring and trying to veto this miserable chatbot which keeps telling me things um, which I don't want to know. So, like I had my credit card rejected. I could not get the, on the bank phone line, I could not get the chatbot to stop telling me what my balance was, which I didn't want to know. I wanted to ask them why they rejected my credit card. Okay, well anyway, so I suspect chatbots will get more intelligent so they actually can recognize the note of despair in a customer's voice and try to adapt to that. All right, here's another short section, which is, um, see so we've done voice and now we do text, which is related because it's natural language processing uh, to process the text. And here's a rather, remember I did this actually in 2013, that you can find events from text information. So it was, I say in 2013 or sometime like that, 12 to 14. I remember a student, uh, one of my students in my class did a project using Twitter to identify earthquakes. And it's well known that you can find about earthquakes quicker from Twitter than you can from the US Geological Survey. I'm not downgrading the US Geological Survey, but nobody can compete with an activity like Twitter, which has the world's people driving it. And there's, those people are gonna notice if the ground shakes. Um, there's a company called Blue Dot, which is in the field of scouring uh, text to, to find um, information. And they claim to have actually uh, been the first to identify the COVID virus in December, 2019, which was a week before other people did it. And um, it came from just looking for uh, presuming increase of news in China, telling people to get out, to no, never visit Wuhan. Well, there was a famous project of this type called Google Flu Trends, which there was a link here to explain why it was canceled, because it um, got the wrong answer in 2013. I'm sure today it will get the right answer. This is just, uh, 2013 was early days in these technologies. Well, here is um, I mean, one of the, if you, go, if you go online, there are lots of papers, research papers or technical reports. And AI has been used in many ways to try to process those. Here is a Microsoft project, which is um, 
using AI to try to categorize medical papers. And uh, that will probably again go into some fully connected network, which allows people to uh, find the, the 4,000 papers every day and the 200 which are related to the topic they're interested in. And also it can do much more detailed studies because these papers have the detailed chemicals, uh, chemical and proteomic uh, signatures recorded in them. They can scan for that and see if it matches the patient's uh, uh, genomic features and drug use and things like that. So I'm sure AI related to publications will grow in importance because 4,000 a day means you get more and more every year. So. Here is one which I only recently learned about a couple of days ago, which is a rather different use of um, natural language processing. So it looks actually at protein sequences, 393 billion amino acids, and it thinks of those as words and the sequences as sentences. And it took the famous NLP processing systems such as transformers and BERT and it runs them on this proteomic uh, language. And it, um, I don't, it didn't fail, but I don't think it did better than other people had. But what was notable about it, it was a giant, giant, giant system. It ran on 5,616 GPUs at a very famous DOE supercomputer called Summit, which is an IBM system with lots of nodes and six GPUs on each node. I think it has around 25,000 GPUs total. So this is probably a little less than a quarter of the machine. And it was because it was needed that because of the these big numbers, 2.1 billion sequences and 393 billion words. Anyway, that is not doing natural language processing, it's using natural language sequence processing techniques to process, to process the language of life. And of course that identifies patterns and signatures and things like that, because that's what Bert, Bert is well known for being able to recognize uh, language patterns such as the correlation between Charles and Dickens or between Romeo and Juliet, Bert certainly knows all of that. Well, we're, we're not going to finish today, but um, let's just get started on this. So um, I have done all the individual categories identified and uh, I identified as being important. And um, we, we actually, all of them are pretty interesting. Again, as I said, the largest number for images and med internet and medical things. But the other ones are also pretty solid and interesting. So these are getting a little more varied and as I call them system based. And um, this I believe is what is, this is sort of using AI to analyze uh, lab results, analyze electronic health records. And the decision support, you get a handed a set of electronic data. What's going on? Is the patient alive or dead or dying or thriving or lingering or what have you. Uh, that would tend to be done, as I said, with a fully connected network. And it's um, so overall decision support is an, obviously an important area. It's not quite, it's a little vaguer than uh, identifying cancer in, a, in an image, but it's um, probably equally if not more important. And um, these are actually our time series. Typically most people's medical data is a function of time. And so you can look at, um, you can identify trends as well. And um, again, all of this is linked to the cost of medicine, which is of course pretty high. And um, this AI on these medical records can really tell you whether you should send the data to the patient to hospital or not. And um, here was a comment that people who 
we admit, I mean, hospitals that we admit patients too often are punished fiscally by the, by the government. And there is a broad area called digital therapeutics. Um, and this is basically an AI, IT based control system for people, especially with chronic disease, chronic uh, illnesses. And um, it's meant to cost 3.3 trillion in 2018. And um, here, is, here is a discussion of um, the types of things they can do, they can find better drugs, they can supplement existing drugs, and they can provide a raft of um, digital service services to um, take the data and present the make decisions and um, presume, and then of course be fiscally and medically successful. And there's quite a few companies in this area. Um, so here we have your pair theory, therapeutics. Uh, therapy, it has a digitally based therapy for substance abuse. Here we have somebody developing a, a therapy for attention deficit disorder. Um, and here we have somebody who is um, Trying to trying to make certain people take the drugs they want, they need to take, because obviously people don't always take the right drugs. They forget to take their drugs, or they take twice as much, or what have you. Here we have schizophrenia and things like that. So here we have diabetes. Here we have living well to reduce your chronic diseases. These are all digitally based overall um, approaches to, to being getting well. All right, I'm going to stop there. Do people have any questions? I will set a homework, which will be application based. So you have I give it the I deliberately gave you plenty of time on the um, on the deep learning homework, so you can just keep on, and we can. I can have um, the application. Continue looking at applications as, as well as doing technologies. Okay. Well, um, well. Uh, next time I will continue, but probably the time after that, I'll ask you to start contributing by discussing some interesting applications you've discovered. All right, last call. By the way, I used to have a picture of my snow, but the snow has melted, so I, I just replaced my background picture by the moon. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.